Um, related topic then, Doppler shift from Earth orbiting satellites. Okay, this is, this is our green, green laser, and this is forward and backward. All right. Good. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm going to take us a step back and um, kind of review a story from my own experience. I'm a mechanical guy, so a lot of the radio stuff is not going to show up early. Um, I've known about Doppler effect like all of us for years. But a few years ago, I ran across an example of it uh, where I didn't expect it and I didn't recognize it. And all of a sudden I thought I need, I need to teach myself a little bit more about this. I'd taken a job with the Ohio Agricultural Research Center in Worcester, helping to develop a, an audio recording system and some analysis of uh, the sounds in agricultural ecosystems as it relates to biodiversity. And uh, I was in a presentation. A student uh, put a uh, slide up on the screen with this audio spectrogram that had this beautiful S-shaped curve in it. And I said, what is that? It didn't look like any frogs or bugs I was expecting. And he didn't know. So I asked him to play the sound. And it was a diesel truck. That's a Doppler shift. The presentation went on. But a few weeks later, I wanted to sit down and teach myself how the sound of a diesel truck and that equation gave rise to that curve. So it's a simple model. Uh, but I have a sound source of fixed frequency moving along a straight path some distance away from the observer. And by inspection, you can get the position vector. First derivative, time derivative gives you the velocity vector. Do a scalar product uh, and divide by the length of the position vector, that gives you the component of the velocity down the position vector. Um, totally a revelation to me. Uh, they hit the wrong one. That's the V. It looked pretty simple in the first, equ first equation. That's the important part. So, And there it is, put in place. Um, we've got the noun expression that de actually defines that curve. And because there are uh, these four parameters, we can curve fit the equation back to the data and extract all that information from the curve fit. And once we have that, with our assumed path, we can calculate the distance, estimate the distance before and after the time of closest approach. So here we go. I went, had my model, I go out looking for moving sound sources. Um, this guy shows up down in our area uh, every summer to do cover crop seeding. Uh, it's a turboprop engine and uh, he flies over our place all the time. So I went out and made some recordings. The uh, one I was interested in is this right here. And I, you know, I look at the description of the engine there are a lot of rotating vanes. So one of them 
is making that frequency. I don't know which one. I don't know. Doesn't matter. But these down here, this family of Doppler shifted curves, I know is the blade passing frequency of the prop. All right. So here's my curve fit. All I did was go in with that spectrogram and pick off the point, put it into the curve fitter. I use one in a technical software called Igor Pro, if you've heard of that. In, it's an interactive curve fitter and got out these values right here of the frequency. Um, this, this is a speed in feet per second, it's about 122 miles an hour, 420 feet off the ground, which is about right, because I was right underneath him when I went over, uh, which is, a, it was thrilling, uh, to be honest. Um, so anyway, about the same time as I was doing this, I was keeping my son, Ethan, uh, aware of what I was doing. And he had just taken a position at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory and he said, you know, we should try your model on satellite radio beacon. So that's what we did. I can get it to go here. Oops, hang on a minute. I think the button is stuck. Yeah. Is that shut off? Okay. So this was several years ago, 10, I guess now. But Ethan came to visit around Christmas and see the poinsettia. We, uh, he brought a radio and, and uh, Yagi antenna along. Uh, we were using the software uh, Raven Light Audacity for recording, uh, Igor Pro for the curve fitting, and the Predict Ephemeris software for the past prediction. Uh, we used a HamSat uh, satellite at, that was active at the time. Its batteries have failed now. And, uh, but you can see we had to keep retuning the receiver. Uh, we were using the upper side band as described earlier, uh, and then just took the audio into the recorders. Uh, the only change I made to my model was to put the speed of light in and place the speed of sound. Uh, we kept the straight line approximation to the uh, segment of the orbit. and. Um, we came up, uh, the, the frequency was, was right on, the uh, velocity was, I think, pretty close. Um, and I went ahead and worked backwards and forwards to estimate the slant range based on the velocity and I just used the straight line path again. Uh, we have two passes here. Uh, one of them is a low elevation pass at 24, about 24 degrees max elevation. The lower one is 71 degrees. You can get an idea, see the change in the shape of the Doppler curve. Uh, but then on the right hand side are the, the pass or the uh, plant range predictions compared to what uh, predict uh, gives in in its past uh, information, and they look re reasonably nice if you stand back. If you look at them closely, uh, the differences run from about five kilometers up to almost sixty uh, in the slant range. But I didn't think that's too bad for just the approximation that we did. So, undeterred, 
I thought if we had these slant ranges uh, from three different ground stations, can we figure out what the actual satellite position is as a function of time as it passes? And uh, since I didn't have actual radio data, Doppler ship data, I used the data sets from the predict pass predictions at three different locations. And uh, that has the advantage of it actually gives you the satellite lo locations so I can see how, how well it does. I use a method of trilateration uh, described in Wikipedia. So they're straight out of there. Uh, this is the uh, coordinate system that I started out with with Ohio being right here. Uh, it's an alti-azimuthal coordinate system. To do the trilateration, uh, you need to get the uh, ground stations into a preferred coordinate system. And that is that one of the stations is at the origin, the next one being on the x-axis, and the third one being in the xy plane. So there are three rotations. Uh, we start out here with a, as I said, an alta azimuthal system. We rotate around the z-axis to point towards Maryland, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, then another rotation uh, around the y-axis, the new y-axis, to put Maryland down on the axis falls away, and then finally a rotation around the x-axis, the new x-axis, put us down onto an anonymous station in southern Virginia somewhere. When you get there, then you can use the trilateration with the slant ranges from PREDICT to calculate the satellite positions uh, at a series of times during the pass. When you get that done, then you do the coordinate system rotations backwards up to this coordinate system. Uh, the first calculations I did once I got back there was to check my slant ranges uh, to the new satellite positions, and they returned OK. So I'm assuming my calculations for the trilateration uh, we're good. Um, then I calculated the ground track results and compared those to predict. I have four runs. Um, they all fell almost identically right on. There were one or two of them that were off, which I assume were some kind of rounding errors maybe. The one down here in the lower right-hand corner uh, if you notice, the PREDICT ground track has some little crooked things in it. The latitude and longitude is only given to the nearest degree uh, in PREDICT. So I added a, a one decimal place onto my results, and I got a pretty, pretty nice straight line for whatever that's worth. I'm going to turn it over to Ethan to wrap up, but I wanted to assure you that I know satellites don't really travel in straight lines. So I, I've worked on a uh, circular orbit model, um, which by the time I got the V done was too big to put on the slide. Uh, kinematically, I'm OK, but my curve fitter now crashes on the thing. So anyway, Ethan? Thank you. All right, so um, I, guess, I guess the microphone's working. Uh, I'm a CW operator, so I'm not <laughs> accustomed to wearing a microphone. Um, so let's see, where's the, the keyboard is down here. Um, so the thing that uh, Dad failed to mention uh, is that uh, there was a first page of a report there from the Applied Physics Lab in 1958 
Um, that is the sort of part of the creation myth of the part of the applied physics lab that I work in, which is the space exploration sector, um, where they developed the transit navigation system that predated GPS. So anyhow, the transit system uses this very technique uh, for navigation solutions rather than satellite orbit prediction. So um, there are several different ways you can cast this problem, and that, that's another one. So um, anyhow, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about where uh, we might take this. Um, obviously, all the work uh, up to this point, except the circular orbit, uh, was done 10 years ago. Um, and uh, so what can, we do, what can we do now? And I think uh, several speakers have talked about how the world has changed in the last 10 years. And uh, one thing uh, is that uh, uh, digitization hardware uh, and uh, the, as the associated processing tools are extraordinarily cheap and plentiful and open source. And uh, uh, the number of uh, spacecraft in low Earth orbit has done nothing but explode over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and so um, we're going to look at a couple other examples um, that, uh, as Phil Erickson uh, said in his talk, uh, I've looked at on my nights and weekends uh, recently. Uh, and that's in addition to spending nights and weekends on his project and nights and weekends on um, a whole bunch of other projects, including keeping my uh, amateur radio station uh, maintained and operational uh, and working some DX. So, um, so this is the setup uh, that we're going to use uh, for the next couple of uh, pictures uh, and, and slides. Uh, so I have a modest uh, VHF tropo system uh, at my house. Um, let me see if this is, yeah, so uh, I have a stack of um, uh, M squared uh, nine element Yagi's um, and they're fed with LMR 600 uh, that I, I think I bought at Dayton for $40 because nobody used, nobody had connectors for LMR 600 and I had a whole drawer full of them. Um, <laughs> so um, anyhow, uh, that's a long story that I'll tell you um, uh, over uh, a bitter drink. Um, so uh, then uh, I didn't have a particularly good low noise amplifier, so I just used uh, my Beater uh, Mirage brick, um, which, by the way, uh, hopefully in the next year will be replaced with a surplus TV transmitter, um, which doesn't have an, in, uh, an LNA. Uh, and then we used just the regular old RTL SDR uh, digitizer. Um, if you want to know the command that we used, it's actually embedded in, the, um, uh, embedded in the presentation, so you can find that. And then this sort of constellation of open source software uh, to do the analysis. So here's a collection uh, that we did. These are, um, so unlike WWV, um, these signals are brought to you by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, so not, not our taxpayer dollars. Uh, these are 50 milliwatt transmitters uh, in low Earth orbit. Uh, there's, there's six of them uh, that are called CAS3C, and then uh, they have a, um, a, a letter appended to them, um, and they, they're, they're sort of um, floating around together and, and near each other. Um, and so I took a recording, and you can see this S-shaped curve. It fades into the noise. I don't know whether I didn't, I failed to track it. Um, so I tried to do low elevation passes because obviously my system is set up for tropo and meteor scatter and not for uh, tracking satellites. Um, so, um, so anyhow, the interesting thing here is that we sort of depart from the S-shape. And I, I should have done an inset to show that. Uh, but the, the, there's a little more Doppler shift here, or a little less maybe, uh, than one would expect. And so, you know, I, I was curious, is this you know, the flat Earth uh, linear orbit uh, stuff that we were talking about before? Um, is it atmospheric and ionospheric refraction? And so the interesting thing about that is that uh, there's a lot of radio science experiments that get done on planetary um, space missions where they use the deep space network to listen to ultra-stable oscillators on the, sp uh, on the satellites, and then they can measure the Doppler shifts due to the atmospheric bending uh, through the atmospheres of those, of those planets. So um, the, that goes back to the 60s, uh, and there's lots of interesting papers, including some that are publicly available in the NASA um, uh, uh, um, astrophysics uh, data archive. So I encourage you to look those up, um, and I can give you more references. But anyhow, we had never seen this before with, with HamSat, because we always sort of acquired orally uh, by tuning that, uh, that TS-700. Um, and, and then manually tuning the receiver to keep the signal in the passband. So, um, so I used uh, Skyfield, uh, which is a Python package uh, that, uh, that will take two line elements uh, to predict what the, what the Doppler uh, should look like um, for, um, for CAS3C uh, during that time period. 
And uh, there is a slight deviation due to the, the relative velocity of a satellite coming up over the horizon. Um, if you're good at picturing things in 3D, you can, you can think about uh, how that, that might work. Um, and for that last pass, I, I started recording just as the spacecraft uh, was coming over the horizon. So I think uh, the red is when I started recording and the gray dots are, are when it came over the horizon. So, um, so this is obviously in a, in a steep part of the curve, a relatively steep part, so that, that little deviation uh, that we saw is, is not present in that. So it's probably not the, the approximation uh, of the orbit. So um, we look here. So I started recording minutes before the satellite comes over the horizon. So you can see there's lots of dead air here, and, and then it comes up. So there's, there's no, no deviation here. This looks exactly like the, um, the predicted path. And you can see the full, if you have good eyes, you can see the full S-shaped curve all the way down there. Um, so there's no, um, no super refraction or anything like that uh, in, in that curve. So uh, I'm also fortunate to live uh, within range of the WA1ZMS beacon. Uh, which is sort of famous in, in the VHF world because it runs uh, a lot of power into high gain antennas pointed at Europe, uh, hoping to catch that two meter transatlantic uh, opening that we're all waiting for. Um, and it's GPS disciplined, so, um, so we know that it's, that it's rock solid. And uh, so I made a recording of that, and lo and behold, when I fire up the, the RTL, it is not stable uh, for the first several minutes. So uh, I think it's highly likely that we just saw the crummy oscillator uh, in the R-tail dongle. So um, there, there's more, more to this um, that we can look into. But again, this gets to Phil's question, what went wrong? Um, I'm, I'm being uh, transparent about that. So um, the, uh, just a few things um, to sort of wrap up. Um, the, these sorts of observations of physical phenomena are within the capabilities and budgets of hams who are even on fixed income, as, as uh, many like to say. Uh, you don't need particularly fancy tools or hardware. I did that data acquisition with a netbook that I bought from another ham for $40 uh, running Linux. Um, and the key thing is, is to be curious and look into the uh, anomalies uh, and interesting things you observe. Um, and I say there's some sort of advanced techniques that we may be able to play with. Uh, to monitor the beacons and, and maybe derive some ionospheric uh, data from them. Um, it's beyond the scope of the talk since we're probably out of time. Um, and I will bundle up at least this, the Python analysis tools that I use for that if anybody's interested. I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm sort of a Luddite. I don't use GitHub yet, so, um, but I, I, do, I do use uh, TAR and GZIP, so um, we, can, we can get those bundled up. So um, I think we'll take questions if there are any.